portion of the evening. Um, before we get into there, I wanted to kind of make a survey of the faculty in the room. Joe Kane, how's everything going? Good. Um, Saturday, end of the line. Movie nuts, of course. Um, and some ecosystem lecturing. Good. Any exams coming up they should be scared about? Yeah, next Thursday. Uh, uh, this is Saturday. Well, we just learned uh, about from limiting nutrients in Lake Erie from our experimental control. It appears that nitrogen and phosphorus are co-limiting in the lake at this moment. A week ago or so, a week ago or so. Um, and then we're going to learn about some, also some ecosystem properties of Saturday, uh, the pathways and catalysts of separation and flow synthesis. So we need data from the moon. Oh, nice. You do actual data rather than a data set from a graph and Maybe if I didn't limnology and then Dr. Kane ecology. Um, Roger, Soma. How's it feeling though? Soma. Field Soma oh, is uh, Are you watching cartoons well? back there on your computer? Are you watching cartoons on your computer back there? No. <laughs> no, I'm filling an emergency request for a paper. Uh, I uh, think you're going well. I gave the students a midterm and a lab practice. Oh, so you're still on speaking terms then? Uh, I don't know. 
over your time, Rick. Sorry about that. So, uh, Dr. Rick Stump had a busy day today. He was interviewed by probably 20 different reporters today. Um, so, Dr. Stump was here to give his uh, 2016 um, ABS forecast prediction for the lake. Um, he's going to do the same for us that, the, that, that Jay did, um, kind of give you a, a, an introduction to his background and how he got to where he got. But really, he's going to give you um, a look into to, to know what satellite use and how we use satellites and what we use for. Um, he gets uh, he came with his uh, bachelor's from Virginia, University of Virginia, University of Virginia, and then Delaware for both your uh, master's and your PhD. But as you'll touch on with Jay, kind of in different fields. So he comes to us with a very diverse background. And so you can join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Rick Stump. Well, I was asked by Chris to give kind of a path of how I got here. And probably good to start. When I applied to the University of Virginia, I'm sure I was going to be a science major. I really liked chemistry, but I loved astronomy. And I got there. First semester I took, there is an environmental sciences department, and they had a course, Environmental Science 101, and I took it, and I never took an astronomy course. <laughs> um, so that was step one. Now, when I, um, for, for the older people here, um, I could type very well. And I managed to land a summer job with USAID, Agency for International Development, in their science and technology office because I could type really well. Which is very interesting because I'd send cable. I had a secret clearance. This is summer job and winter job. I had a secret clearance. I would send cable to agencies. You've heard about Hillary Clinton's issue. Well, these are all cable. Very interesting. I would send cable that, that on topics that would show up in the Washington Post. Now, I didn't have a top secret clearance, so I never saw the stuff that showed up on the front page, but the stuff that showed up in the back section. Well, Science Sense, they were, there had recently, just a few years before, been a satellite launch called Landsat. And this agency working in these places like Africa, they were trying to figure out what they could do with this satellite. They had to have the scientist clerk, and so the guy who was working on it, the geologist, Chuck Withington, Dr. Chuck Withington, who was at University of Minnesota, he was working with this, and he had me do a project, say, in West Africa, trying to figure out if I, we could tell what the field. They would burn fields, and they needed to get some idea of how much was being burned. So I was working with this and actually doing it. This is really old. This was, there was no computers involved. I was, I was taking negatives and enhancing them with uh, blueprint stuff, with ammonia. You develop them with ammonia. Completely different. This was great. I loved it. So, I never took, there were no remote sensing courses in college at all. They, they didn't have it, didn't, didn't exist. Went to grad school. Oh, environmental sciences is interdisciplinary. We took geology, ecology, meteorology, and hydrology. And then you could emphasize one. And I took geology, oddly enough, I was a geology emphasis. I took meteorology, several meteorology courses, including graduate ones. Only took one ecology course. Um, Bill Odom, some of you, the Odom family, yeah, he taught my ecology course. Um, and so, one ecology class, so what do I do when I go to grad school? Master's degree on wetlands, salt marshes. And I figured out how sediment moved around. So I got the geology part, I figured out how sediment moved around. And finally, they had a project in Delaware Bay that to figure out Delaware Bay, a major project, and they wanted to know the distribution of um, sediment and anything else I could do with satellites. So I decided to work on sediment and chlorophyll for my PhD with Landsat. Managed to land a job with NOAA because they had a new opening up in an, an assessment group. And from there, the, so that's how I, how did I get into this field? That's the path, which had, there was no planning, except that the remote sensing, I was going to do something with the satellite stuff. This was just too cool. Um, um, the one other part on this that got me, why am I here? I'm an oceanographer, coastal oceanographer. I love small boats. That works great right here. I love marshes. You don't have marshes here. Trust me. I can show you marshes that you would not want to leave. Um, but I was working on algal blooms. I came up with a method to detect algal blooms in Chesapeake Bay. And I went down to a meet conference in North Carolina, the Water Institute. This was in November 1987, about the first week in November. And one of the guys there said they'd heard that they're having some horrible problem with some toxic algae down at the coast. 
And so I got information. It turned out someone from the NOAA Fisheries Lab, Pat Tester, Dr. Pat Tester, who was a, um, a plankton ecologist at Copapod. She was the only person on the coast there who could figure out anything with phytoplankton. She knew enough of this. So I go back. I'm in D.C. Here's another part of the story. So I go, okay, maybe I can help. I know nothing about this. I call her up. Go, hello, I'm Rick Stump from NOAA in Washington. I'd like to help you. I process satellite data. Well, there's silence on the other end of the phone for about a half a minute. And later she told me she had never gotten a phone call from anyone from Noah Washington who offered anything. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we started off, I was processing satellite data, looking for the, we were looking for the location of the Gulf Stream, because this stuff came up from the Gulf of Mexico. This is Florida red tide. It had never been seen north of Florida. And we managed, and she had been going for the last two weeks trying to find someone to get her satellite imagery. Today, this sounds odd. Well, when we started routine processing of data, satellite data, for there, I'm in DC. There is no internet. The, set, the receiving stations are 20 miles away in Maryland. They come in on tape. They're put on tapes. Okay. Any of the students here ever seen a big computer tape? Yeah, holds. It doesn't even hold what a USB anywhere. They're on a computer tape. <laughs> so. We would have a cart when we started what was called the Coast Watch, became the Coast Watch program. They would download it, put it on a tape, get a courier, drive it to our my lab. We would then process it. We'd turn around, I'd take a photograph, we had a special twenty five thousand dollar camera, FedEx the photo down to Beaufort. That was the system. Wow. This was great. Live science. And so I was hooked. I then moved to Florida. Red, that's the center of red tide. An ocean color satellite came up. And we were started to map and forecast the red tide down there, started a bulletin down there. And back to Pat Tester, well, she happened to know Gary Fonensteel, who was a scientist at NOAA's Great Lakes Research Lab. And he was starting on working on cyanobacteria. And he really wanted the spatial stuff. He would like to get an ability to forecast it. She said, I know just the person to help you do this. So she made the connection to him, and that was uh, 10 years ago. And so here I stand now working on Lake Erie. So that's, that's the story. There's nothing straight. I had no idea I would ever be in Lake Erie, not whatsoever. And I'm glad I'm up here. This is, this is a beautiful place. It's particularly great when there's no algae here. <laughs> so that's why I'm here. Um, this, I'm going to tell you a little bit. I, we've been working with satellite data, and I give you a little idea of perhaps a little education or training in how we work with the satellite data. Because mostly it's all, here's the, either a pretty picture or here's the answer. So I'm going to try to explain that. And the thing on that is um, we're now, we now have a project. I'm working with EPA, US EPA, USGS, and NASA. And our goal is to monitor every medium to large lake in the country for cyanobacteria and to generate from the older data a 10-year time series for the entire country for every medium to large lake. We're going to do that because of Lake Erie. Lake Erie is the test area that has made this all possible. So, and the question, well, why Lake Erie? Well, just to get a sense out of that, just one part, um, Lake Erie is a great lake. It's a big lake. And well, Minnesota, you know, Minnesota is the land of 10,000 lakes. I think it's 12,235 to be, they, they counted them. Um, Lake Erie is bigger than every one of, every bit of surface water in Minnesota. Just to get an idea of how much water. And it's interesting. Um, there's a slide. This work? Yeah. I have to use that. Okay, that works. All right. So. Um, that's what you see. When I say a view from 700 miles up, well, uh, Justin took this about three days before that satellite image. That's the view from 700 miles up. So what can we do with that? Um, there's a national problem. I should say, why do we care nationally? I'll give you a little backdrop. You know in Lake Erie, Toledo, that sort of thing. Do you know that sea otters have died from microcystin poisoning in California? Because Water coming out of lakes and out in the oysters right at the coast, they eat the oysters and they die. Um, San Francisco Bay has both marine toxins and freshwater toxins all in the same muscle. Not that I want to eat any muscle 
know San Francisco Bay anyway, but the fact is they are there. Um, this past week, everyone, many of you have probably heard about the problem that Florida is having down on the St. Lucie River. That is a tidal estuary where they're having a problem, and they have microcystin there in that tidal estuary. So this is a problem of very wide thing. This is um, every every state. Whoops, every state has an issue um, of some sort. The ones that um, don't, the gray areas, they don't want to monitor, don't want to admit it. That's pretty much the short answer. Oh, and yes, uh, keep your dogs out of the water. This is a toxin. Dogs can eat anything pretty much from the street, but this is a toxin. And they're small, and when they're in scum, they, their mouths are going right through it, and they look their fur, it's, and, and they die. In Maryland, we, we actually lose um, usually a couple of dogs every year to microcystin toxicity, and it, it happens all over the country. So everyone, please let people know that. I also say that, too, because people care more about their dogs than their children. So <laughs> if they hear that, they might keep their children out of the water, too. Lake Okeechobee, I mentioned, the algal bloom, and this is microcystis and on the coast down there. Um, now, if you're going to monitor cyanobacteria, you're going to have to be able to detect that and not detect other stuff. There's a lot of things in the water. First, there's sediment. There's, um, who's the person doing the sediment? There's several sediment studies in the REU. Um, project. Yeah. Um, there's sediment. There's other algae as well, which is a huge issue. Diatom, green, uh, the chlorophytes. Um, and there's just other things. And so if you, if you confuse one with another, you can't do this as a national program. Well, you've seen this image of, of Lake Erie, and everybody looks at the bloom. But what I want to show you is the other part, why Lake Erie is so good. This is sediment. This is the Detroit River plume sediment. We have other things in Lake Erie, very conveniently. If I was working in one of those 10,000 lakes in Minnesota, I have one lake, it has one bloom, I have no other information. Here, I have this lake because it's so big with such a diverse range of things. Oh, if you look closely in here, I need, we need to turn the lights off, but there's a Maumee River plume here. You see the brown? That's Maumee River water, which is dark brown, which is not the same as the Detroit River plume. So we need to be able to tell all this stuff apart. And even on this, um, looking at this, well, is that sediment or is it cyanobacteria? I have to tell you it is cyanobacteria, but it does change color as they, as they age. So it's very important to be able to tell these things apart. And a wonderful thing on Lake Erie is it has all of these conditions. We have diatoms in the spring. We have the Maumee River plume. We have the Detroit. We have the resuspension. So if we get something to work that doesn't pick those things up, we're doing well. Um, we also have something else. Sandusky Bay um, always has a planktophoric bloom we heard about. Some of the people are working on that. And one of the other issues is microcystis is a scum former. You know, it floats up to the surface, and so there's a general assumption, well, all you can do is pick up scum. Planktophoric is not a scum former. Uh, extremely rare when it does because it doesn't produce the colonies. Um, um, I'm sure all the students here have, can recognize all the uh, cyanobacteria, right? They've been trained. Um, anyway, it produces a change, but it's always dispersed. This is typically what it looks like. So we're not looking at a scum former. So if we can make sure we can always identify Sandusky Bay, we're also well off. Well, how do we do this? Okay, little physics here. Everyone remembers your physics, I'm sure, from your spectra. Uh, short one is we have blue light between 400 and 500 nanometers, green 5 to 6, red 6 to 700. This is near infrared. It's not to be confused with thermal infrared. This not heat. This is reflected light. Um, this is ultraviolet um, light. This is a reflectance spectra of, it happens to be microcystis, um, and it's from Lake Erie. And what I want to do is show characteristics on here that make how we approach this so critical. The first off, if you notice, is what's the highest reflectance? Somebody in the room? What color has the highest reflectance? This is not a hard question. Green. Green. How about that? What color is it? Green. Okay. <laughs> Good. We see that. Um, there's, a, there's a variety. The chlorophyll A absorbs blue light, and it happens to also absorb red light. Um, but also, they have a whole bunch of um, carotenoids, a, a long list that absorbs them. Well, there's a problem here. If, so if you wanted to look at the green and the 
like the green itself, you have to take into account this whole area here. And the additional thing is um, there are tannins in the water. Uh, tannin, T. What color is T? Again, not a hard question. It's brown. It's brown because all the blue light has been absorbed. So you put tannins in, that's bad. Um, do you have any iron soils here? We got loads of red clay in Maryland. I don't know. You know what color iron oxide is? Red. Red. Why is it red? Because it absorbs blue light. So blue light for chlorophyll is absorbed by chlorophyll. It's absorbed by iron stains on the sediment. It's absorbed by all those um, in the peats and everything else, all those organic compounds. They all absorb blue light. So we can't do anything with that. So we have a nice peak here. But now we have a couple interesting wiggles here. It drops here because water absorbs near infrared light really well, very well. And keep that in mind. So light goes into the water and doesn't come out. But we have these two little wiggles here. This one is phycocyanin. And can anyone guess phycocyanin? What color phycocyanin might be? Blue. Blue. I heard a blue there. Yes. Because it absorbs um, what we see. We see very strongly on this part of the red here. It absorbs red light very strongly. And so it's blue. But we get a wiggle here. And chlorophyll A absorbs red light strongly here. We have another wiggle there. So by targeting, this is the bands for the key satellite we use. These were put here intentionally, one to pick up phycocyanin and the other to pick up chlorophyll. So we now have a way to go after chlorophyll specifically and also phycocyanin as an indicator. Phycocyanin does have a problem in that it's not quite as stable as we'd like it to be. But phycocyanin, I should say, sorry, I didn't say that. All cyanobacteria have phycocyanin. Virtually all cyanobacteria, phycocyanin. All freshwater cyanobacteria definitely have the yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. The marine ones have phycourethrin and not a lot of phycocyanin. I'll be happy to talk about that. But all freshwater ones have phycocyanin in them. So this is an indicator. And this is only found in red algae. You do not have, is there any red algae? In we have one species. It probably doesn't produce worms, yeah. Let's see it. So diatoms don't have it. You do not get this wiggle on a diatom. Chlorophyll, now this is a very interesting one, and I think, um, yeah, let's see. I don't know if I put the other one in. I should have put in. Um, made a mistake. I've debated back and forth on this. Um, chlorophyll fluoresces in diatoms. Uh, is anyone using a fluoroprobe for? Yeah, okay. I don't know how, if you know how that works, but they excite the chlorophyll with blue light, and it, and it excites and it uh, fluoresces at 600 and about 680 nanometers. Now, it happens that this has to do with the photosystem, photosystem for photosynthesis. And diatoms and chlorophyll fluoresce, the chlorophyll fluoresces really strongly, right at the same wavelength it absorbs. Cyanobacteria don't. The chlorophyll is in a different photosystem, photosystem, I'm uh, sorry, I checked it out, whether it's photosystem one or two, can't remember. It's in a different one, so it doesn't fluoresce. So that means we have a huge dip here, whereas a diatom would have a big bump. And so uh, do I have the example? I don't have the example. I left out one slide. So we have a huge dip in chlorophyll that would be caused by cyanobacteria, and we have an indicator. So um, and just to go on to one other level, remember I said that water absorbs near infrared light really well? Well, what happens if you put a scum on the surface? Does any light go in the water? No. Uh, cells, plant cells of all sorts, including cyanobacteria cells, scatter near infrared light actually better. If we could see near infrared, um, we, we would be able to see them even better than with green light. There's actually, um, there used to be color infrared film that was used for plant monitoring that was incredibly effective because you could actually tell if the plants were well or not based on the infrared much better than the green. So this is actually scum, and you can see how much brighter it is than the scum side. Oh, great, we've got it. Oh, that's not a mayfly, though, uh, than it is in the red. So we can easily match the scum patterns. Now, just to go a step on this, uh, one of the very first remote sensing topics was actually done in California from aerial photography, that color, that infrared photography. And they found, and this was 1974 in Nature, that they could map these blooms uh, cyanobacteria based on the scum um, from aerial photography. These were all photographic patterns. This is a huge breakthrough in remote sensing.
show and we could actually find algal blooms. And it was actually done there before um, um, many of the uh, marine, uh, marine remote sensing was done. Um, so just to give an idea of this, I had this figure up earlier. This is true color. And what I've done is replaced the green band here with the infrared. There's no question where all the scum is. And so the first part is, how do I know where the scum is? We go to the near infrared and we have an answer. Unambiguous where all the scum is. And this is the same, by the way, these are the same images. So you can see how effective that is, is pulling that out. We can also quantify that. We have some different methods. Pretty simple. You just do a simple difference of the, infra, the near infrared and the red, and we now have a ratio, and we can quantify how much scum there is. But you can see very clearly where it is. And that's one of the key indicators we have. We have a scum forming one. Diatoms don't produce scum, by the way. It doesn't happen. So if you're looking for scum, you can do that. Now, going to the cyanobacteria blooms, you can see what we have here. This is an index. This is the chlorophyll dip that was indicated as having plectocyanin. And what you notice, of course, is you pick up all of these features, but we're also picking up, this is in fact cyanobacteria. And if you look closely, we are not getting the Maumee River plume right here, even though it's highly colored. We're not getting the Detroit River plume or that. We're not getting the feature in here, none of those other areas. We're only picking it up. And that's the key part. On one, on one image, we can say we are not confusing it with sediment. That's one of the first questions I get. How do you know you're not separating from sediment? And the reason we're getting that dip caused by the pigment. Nothing else can produce that strong drop in absorption at those wavelengths than phycocyanin or chlorophyll. Anything else largely going up and down, you get the sediment. So Lake Erie allows us to actually test these algorithms under a range of conditions. And we can look at them. We don't pick up the blooms in the spring when we include the phycocyanin. So we have this whole indicator in a nice microcosm that you can't get elsewhere. Just to look on a different side, that's the same sort of image. And here is, of course, extensive bloom in 2015, um, how things kind of sort out. Um, overall, this is actually different resolution. Sandusky Bay, by the way, shows up very nicely. Um, there's actually a little bit of a plume of sediment on the inside here, which is not being picked up. So that's one part. Now another question is, well, we, we can, we're, we're, we're doing the, um, this dip here, and uh, just to back up so it's clear, I, we literally measure how deep is this drop. That's what we quantify, and how, and here there's actually a lump produced because this drops. So we're measuring how high is that. That's what we're measuring. Well, in Lake Erie, we came up with a number. We compared it to microsystem cell count. Someone is doing cell counting for the flow count. I'm trying to be relevant here. Um, um, so we compared it to cell counts, and we came up with a relationship that one of our units of 0 .0 whatever converts 0.001 is 100,000 cells per mil. So I was working with some people from EPA, and they had a bunch of data from a, a National Lakes Assessment Study in 2007 and 2008. Um, and they were, um, um, they had some data from Grand Lake St. Mary's. They had it from Lake Champlain, which has some, northern Lake Champlain has some wicked cyanoblooms blooms, and a bunch of other lakes, and a whole bunch of Florida lakes. So they said, okay, let's take this relationship, and let's compare it to the matches. This is the one-to-one -one line. Lake Erie, no retuning for anywhere else. The answer is, you want to know what the, the concentration is? Lake Erie gave us the answer. We now know our CI, our index of 0.001 equals 100,000 cells per mil. We can now go forward and do that. We um, went on another side. We actually don't have a, a complete data set for Lake Erie, but we said, well, let's just, we, we got some data from Florida Lakes. And in this case, this was actually using a radiometer um, to measure it, where we simulate a satellite. We have this device that kind of looks like a radar gun, pointed at the water, and we measure the reflectance. We get the reflectance of the light. Um, by the way, there's a, there's a cell phone app that I've got that is really cool as an approximation of a radiometer. Um, you can get the red, green, and blue reflectance. Um, I've, I've been playing with it in the last week or two. So, uh, some optics guys at the University of Maine developed it. It was a master's thesis project, actually, by the way. A student did it as a master's thesis, um, created this app. And um, very, very cool. You can actually 
get the turbidity of the water. And if you're, someone's using NTUs, this will return NTUs. So we can actually test it if you have some interest in trying that out. Um, anyway, we came up with a relationship for chlorophyll. Um, this is done in Florida, and it's, it's matching pretty well for Lake Erie. I don't have that example here. So this is our index to chlorophyll. And so let's start asking questions in other places. Florida actually has a lot more lakes than Minnesota. They, they, they don't want to boast about it, but they, they have like 20,000 lakes. Um, and um, they're all over the place. Um, the color scheme is the same here. Lake Okeechobee, by the way, you heard of, has, has a mild bloom. Lake Apopka here um, has, is always bad. Um, in fact, one of my uh, colleagues, he was at a meeting in Florida, and he had said something about Lake Apopka showing up as very high, and he was not a guy from EPA in North Carolina, he's not familiar with it. One of the guys from Florida said, what do you mean, Lake Apopka is our cleanest lake? What? And then, no, 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 no. Lake Apopka is like Grand Lake St. Mary's. It's, it's about that. It's terrible. What we have here is, so we took that relationship and said, okay, and this is field data. They are all scaled exactly the same. And so you can see, like Lake Apopka is running, this is around 60 to 80 micrograms of cyanobacteria. The field data is around 60 micrograms per liter. You can see how much more data. Lake Harris, Right here is yellow, it's much lower. Lake Dora has a lot of variability. And Lake Monroe, we say, is very clear of cyanobacteria, which is in fact it is. So this was all done. This was not tuned to this data set. This was tuned separately from field data and transferred to satellite. So this is all satellite tuned from field data. That gets to the point, we do a robust method, and it will work consistently. So it's exactly the same procedure for Lake Erie. We said we're estimating the total chlorophyll for cyanobacteria in Lake Erie. That's the approach. We take that and apply it to chlorophyll, and this is what we can get. So we now have a time series, and if someone's asking what happened in Lake Dora, well, it dropped a lot, then it came up. We now have that information. By the way, these are single station samples taken monthly, only one. This is the average over the whole lake, not just one station. So um, if you, when you all, <laughs> Later on in the summer, when the bloom gets going over by Maumee River, hopefully it's not going to come here while you're still here, the students, to go over and take a look at how incredibly variable it is. But um, that kind of variability is not too surprising. Um, there are other places. I mentioned Clear Lake, um, um, which I don't actually know why it's clear, because apparently it's been eutrophic for quite a long time. Um, but they have health advisories due to microcystis there. This is Klamath Lake in North Northern California, if you want to get into a major issue, there's a set of uh, Native American um, tribes who have lands there and fishing rights, and the blooms are scum, horrible scum, all through the Klamath system, and it makes a mess out of the fishing, the boating, all, all the uses, and there are lawsuits, and it's a royal problem. Um, well, if we take these, this is actually the border of Oregon and California. And of course, just to make it interesting, Upper Klamath Lake happens to be in Oregon, and then the Klamath River goes into California. And I'll show these two here. And then there's federal dam, there's U.S. Army Corps dam. Oh, politics like you wouldn't believe. I, all I do is, I'm reserving this for California. They can figure out the politics, I won't go near this. Um, this is what it looks like. Wouldn't that look like it came right out of Lake Erie? Yeah, that's, that's kind of typical. This was done by the um, Karuk tribe, the uh, California Water Board. So we've taken our Lake Erie algorithm. We've added a chlorophyll algorithm from Florida. We're now in California. This is estimate um, upper Klamath. We're actually off the charts on some of this. We're 100 plus micrograms per liter over the entire lake. Um, this is like 10 miles long or so. Well, we analyzed, we got some field data from Iron Gate Reservoir. We also had um, Copco. The field data, so this is, again, this is emphasized. Lake Erie algorithm, Florida chlorophyll applied here. There's no local tuning. We estimated this bloom to be about 40 to 50 micrograms and this one to be 30. Oh, this tells us there's a bloom cyanobacteria present. We confirm there was cyanobacteria present. Um, and here is their field data, 40 micrograms around 20 to 30 from field data. So 
going from Lake Erie, we have now pushed through going across the country. And these are, these are the lakes showing them at different times when it's relatively low and relatively high. Uh, again, now Lake Clear Lake, mentioned again. And we can actually pick up the timing of this. Um, this, is, this is the relevant one here. I won't go into details. Um, a bloom appeared. We can now get the timing of the bloom. It was in early um, um, July. And um, you can see this was actually field data. There was the, the change occurred starting, first chlorophyll started increasing, and then it was still below the FICO sign of detection, but it showed up all through the lake. And we could pick that up um, 100,000 micrograms per liter in mid July, and that's what the chlorophyll is today. So we're able, actually able to get that timing down quite well. Uh, we can go into tidal waters. This is Potomac River, uh, right near uh, DC. DC. Washington's just up here. This is all tidal, tidal freshwater. And the Potomac doesn't usually get blown, but occasionally after a wet spring and a very dry summer, so that the river stops flowing through, it becomes almost like a lake. And all with the tide, it just kind of slowly sloshes back and forth. And about every 10 years, a bloom shows up. Well, the state of Maryland. Their budget keeps getting cut. Sounds familiar for monitoring. They used to monitor about every, they were, uh, 15 years ago, they were monitoring every week, then it's every two weeks, and now it's once a month, except sometimes only when there's dead fish. That's <laughs> kind of when they monitor. So they got a report, and they went out and had a station, and their question to us is, you tell us how big this is. So they had one station. Um, by the way, can you see the sawdust look in the water? Yeah, microcystis. It's the same stuff. Um, so we gave them the extent all through here, and then there was a tropical storm, Irene, that came through, flood on the Potomac, and uh, it was about a week, and, a week and a half later, and it was all gone, completely flushed out, and we showed that. So we got the extent of that bloom and confirmed that it was actually present um, overall. So we're able to pick out that information and apply that as far as where it goes. And again, this is Lake Erie. This is Lake Erie translated over to the Potomac River. and then. You've been hearing about Okeechobee. Um, this is the same process for um, SCUM. This is the IR band. Um, now, mind you, Lake Okeechobee, by the way, is um, it's big, but it's about 20 miles across. It's about the size of the Western Basin, a little smaller than the Western Basin. Um, that's all SCUM here. And the spillway, by the way, the St. Lucie estuary is right here. Florida, Florida in summer is so fun. Lake Okeechobee creates its own weather. You probably noticed that here. The only clear spot in the entire lake. This is actually normal because of the, um, I could go into this from uh, my meteorology class in college and explain how this works, but um, it, it's clear. But the St. Lucie estuary is right there, and the entrance is here of the canal, which, of course, you have this massive bloom right there. And the other side is the Caloosahatchee here, which you haven't heard much of, but it's the fourth county that has a problem. That comes out here. So you have all this microcystis heading out there in this massive bloom that is like the equivalent of 2013 on uh, Lake Erie as far as the extent. This is actually the index we use for Lake Erie, and so it's the same quantification. So we're up at, you know, 1,500 micrograms per liter of chlorophyll and more in some of this area. This is unfortunately one kilometer data, which we hope to uh, replace when the new satellite goes up this uh, when we, the new satellite went up this year. We're using right now a satellite called MODIS, and MODIS can give true color at this resolution, but it can only do the index at one kilometer. And all the other data was with Maris. I'm not going to go into those, but Maris had 300 meter data. Its replacement, Maris failed or satellite failed two years ago, and its replacement was just launched in February. Um, we're hoping that we'll be able to, we're just to the point of processing it, and that it will also be, we'll allow allowed to distribute it later, by maybe as soon as August, we might actually start having uh, OLCHI data. Um, but that'll get us back to high resolution. So this is very coarse, one kilometer data um, overall. But that is the bloom that ended up producing the, uh, the whole problem on, on the St. Lucie River. I can't tell you how odd Lake Okeechobee has. It has so much sediment and so much muck the internal cycling that we've been talking about, uh, like Okeechobee, is going to be internally cycling until so the sea level rise finally takes us. <laughs> um, so um, where I'd like to just go on this, we started with Lake Erie and the
question was, can we find blooms? And the thing is, if we use this very targeted chlorophyll absorption band, and the chlorophyll absorption band is specific to cyanobacteria most of the time, phycocyanin as an additional indicator, we can find phycocyanin, we can find cyanobacteria, and we can quantify, and the method applies across from there to lakes across New England, to Florida, to California, and our goal is to kind of go across the country, all because of the information we have here. Okay, thank you. those types, um, the, uh, that color that I mentioned, the green, if we really needed to separate them out, that particular index could be used to tell them apart because they are different colors. One, they do look different in, in, in the hue, so we might be able to, to tell them apart that way. The total brightness of sediment we work on, we also have a product for attenuation, um, and we're uh, looking to try to expand to, to push that further to actually be visibility product, like a sucky disc, actually maybe a sucky disc and dust. Wow. And it, you'd think that attenuation and sucky depth are exactly the same thing. This is light attenuation. They are not the same. Um, and I think uh, my best experience on, I knew this conceptually, you know, I, I'm 
not an optical physicist, but I at least hung around them enough to learn some things, and I took some physics. Um, but I was told they're not the same. And I was down in Florida Bay. We went out. We were doing out. I was working on trying to map turbidity um, and the seagrass die-off that happened there in the um, early 90s. And incredibly, went, it was blowing 25, 30 knots. And fortunately, we had this local guy who was great, blowing hard, so much better with this get wetter. That's all cool. <laughs> um, and so we're going over these. It's all carbonate. It's carbonate mud on the bottom, all carbonate. And so the water, when it's stirred up over the carbonate, it's like milk, skim milk, just this white, white, white stuff. Well, we're going over areas, and I'm looking and going, that's seagrass, that's sand, mud, that's seagrass, that's sand. Why? Because it had a green tinge to it. The water is that deep. But because there's nothing in the water absorbing light, it's all this pure carbonate. The light would bounce down to the bottom, hit the seagrass, all the other colors get absorbed by the chlorophyll and bounce its way back up. And so if you took a secchi disk, the secchi disk depth would be this high, but the light attenuation was negligible. And I go, oh, I guess these optical physicists know what they're talking about. <laughs> so we're actually looking at that because like our ten we have attenuation metric, which is um, a not picking up. Some of this is probably limestone mud up here, and we're not picking that up as a, as a light attenuation, and we need to get that for visibility. So what I'm hoping is we'll actually get a routine system of collecting secchi disks here that we can use to actually test visibility as a product. It could be an REU project for uh, another year to help work, work up the data set. Can work, can work up the data set that we could get collected. Yeah. Not a widening event. No, this this would be resuspended stuff out of Lake St. Clair, and I don't. It, it looks white. I don't know what the sediment type is in the bottom of Lake St. Clair, and I would really like to get there. Um, which because it's all because the parts I need to see are Canadian, and I'm a federal government employee. It gets a little harder. I'm trying to work out. Canadians are happy to have me, but it, I'll have to go on a Canadian boat. Um, well, you probably have that problem. Do you have to stop at the border with your boats, or do you not? Just don't no, we have to, you just have to declare if you're going into the Canadian water zone. Right? Yeah, yeah, but if you, if you grab an anchor or if you touch the bottom, you can't take the bottom. You have to go check in. Yeah, yeah, right. So I need to be in a Canadian boat because I don't, I don't know what it is. But I do know it, it, what we're seeing is the resuspended sediment out of Lake St. Clair. So that um, this, uh, this here started in this up here. And with the Thames River here, comes out here, when it's in high flow, you will actually see a brown plume coming out on the side of the Detroit River in the high-res imagery because it just follows the coast right around on that side. So uh, with that, that's our shine for 9 o'clock. Yeah. Good time. Right. It's fantastic. Right. So uh, if we can thank Dr. Rich Dunn for uh, – So, um, yes, yeah, more weeks with us. So next week we will actually have uh, Debbie Lee, who is the director of NOAA Glarel. So she's based out of Ann Arbor office. She'll be here. And then Robin Wilson will be here, which was referenced in, in Jay Martin's talk. Uh, she's more on the social science side of things, but really she's been doing a lot of um, surveying of farmers and feeling what their attitudes are on all the data that's coming out and their willingness to implement the MP and, and how they're really absorbing all the information. So uh, both these individuals will be with us next next Thursday. So uh, have a good weekly class, and we'll see.